I know nothing about New York. You can cut I that know. out. Welcome back to the Up and Coming Artist Podcast. Hello, I am Ben, an animator. <laughs> Hello, I'm Christian, a videographer. Is that what you were looking for? You know, I'm starting to see a trend in our podcast. You mean of cheesy transitions? No, of recording next to a busy street. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Apparently, the only place in Fullerton that isn't playing copyrighted music is like the middle of an intersection <laughs> or something. Yeah, this is an audio-only podcast, so you don't see. We're sitting on the middle divider. But anyway, let's talk about our guest. Yes, Elizabeth Castillo is a fantastic storyboard artist who, as you know, Christian, because you were actually there for this interview <laughs> this time, gave everyone some incredible advice, despite cars driving by and honking at us. Yeah, she had a lot of really good things to say about storyboarding, pre-production, research, just all the good things you need to hear when you're trying to get into the industry. And so, for those of you trying to get in right now, I hope you enjoyed this interview in the middle of a street with Liz Castillo. Do I get a participation award this time? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and even though our voices sound exactly the same, he answered his own question. <laughs> <laughs> you aren't supposed to mention that! <laughs> Welcome back to the Up and Coming Artist Podcast. I'm Ben, I'm an animator. I'm Christian, a photographer, and I'm actually here this time. Christian, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How are you feeling? I am super excited. Do you want to know why? Why are you excited? Because we are here today with an amazing, amazing artist. Someone who is impressing me with their work, and particularly their storyboards. And we are here with Liz Castillo. Welcome, Liz. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> You just got done with the 24-hour animation competition. Could you tell us about that, like what it is and what you guys just finished? Um, yeah, the 24-hour competition is hosted uh, by Cal State Long Beach, I believe. And this is my second year doing it, and basically you have 24 hours um, with a team of five to basically animate a whole short, and it has to be 30 seconds, no longer, no less. So very difficult to make sure it's exactly 30 seconds right <laughs> and that just finished up yesterday right yes i'm still a little out of it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it gets intense you know like um i don't think any of us napped or anything so we kind of just went straight for it and yeah like because been up since like 5 a.m well i had personally been up since 5 a.m because i oh. worked that same day oh no. so it's like i've been up for more than maybe 24 hours yeah. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> At what hour did it really hit you that you were going to be up for so long or that you were up for so long? Probably at 6 a.m. Oh. Um, I think when we got to the coloring part is when I started feeling like nodding off. Because, uh -huh. like, for me personally, coloring in animation isn't my favorite thing to do. <laughs> so that's where I felt like I was falling asleep because it was a little tedious and boring for uh -huh, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. What was the topic this year? Um, the topic was, oh gosh, empathy. It was empathy. Um, I don't know if we hit that mark. <laughs> but... Oh, great. It's kind of hard to wrap up a complex topic like that in 30 it's seconds. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Well, and in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So what was your part on the film? Um, my part was that long seven seconds of the little flower. It's a dandelion. Uh -huh. And he gets smacked off the table. Oh, Yeah, right. that was my section. And... Um, so I was the team leader, and I got everybody together. So I was basically like the pre-production part, like a PA almost. I made an itinerary. I planned out how everything was going to go, so it ran smoothly that nice. whole day. That's so, great. Mm -hmm. I also did storyboarding with the help of Christina. She helped me storyboard. Awesome. So that was fun. That's super cool. Very nice. Were there any funny moments or funny stories that happened in your tired stupor? <laughs> well, um, well, nobody was there for this, but I like got up and I was frustrated with the little scene so I got a piece of pizza and then I started walking around by myself and I was wearing a onesie too and so I just kind of felt like that little madness going on where I was just uh -huh. like it's 4am and I'm eating a big old slice of pizza and in a onesie and a security guard walks by yeah. and I'm like 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> it just like hits you, and then you find it hilarious. You find everything hilarious at like 3 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of us have experienced a little bit of this working on, so I've done video in the past, um, you guys obviously have done animation, and I just want to touch on this topic of how important pre-production is. So do you think that that added to your success? I definitely think so, because I basically took the knowledge I had from my pre-production class and, like, listening to, like, people talk about their process with pre-production and applied it to us. Because I don't think we would have been as ready if we didn't have all that stuff planned out. And um, pretty much that's what you do in pre-production is you plan it out to a T. So that also helped organize making sure not the same person was like doing the same scene. Right. Because that would have been so awkward. Like, no, I'm animating that. <laughs> like, uh, we just wasted three hours. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really important to keep track of everybody like that. Yeah. Do you think a lot of students kind of try to skip over that step and get right into it or I think the newcomers there was a couple of freshmen and they were they were actually asking our team for help because they didn't know how to uh, animate in Photoshop oh, so yeah. um, I think that was like difficult for them but a lot of um, the other teams were like seasoned veterans who know you know what they're doing so right but yeah there was a new team that uh, had a little trouble so I was like going between my team and them oh, like man. helping them and I was like you're so planned and prepared <laughs> that you're saving everybody time oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but luckily Mike was there and he was able to oh, explain yeah. some stuff to them too so I was like thank you Mike <laughs> yeah. and she's referring to Mike Dietz who you guys would probably know as the animator from Earthworm Jim that old Sega Aladdin game and a bunch of other great stuff he's a great professor at our school shout out Mike That's so cool. um but anyway, so let's take it back. So we're here, sitting here, as people could probably tell, right by a street, right outside of Cal State Fullerton, which is where we met, and where you just did your 24-hour animation. So I think we met in Barbara's class, right? Mm -hmm. Which was the uh, animal wildlife drawing class. Yes. Do you want to talk about that for a second, and anything you might have gleaned from it? Um, actually... Yes, because that's kind of where my art style is going to lately. Um, I recently did like a little artist profile for one of my classes, and I realized all my drawings have become animals. And I'm like, <laughs> how did this even happen? I don't even sketch animals on my free time. These are all projects I've been doing, and they all, they're all they all animals. And I'm like, where, right. where did this happen? Right. <laughs> so I'm a little scared, though, because I'm like, I'm drawing anthropomorphic animals. I'm afraid that it could get into that little weird section of where oh, I yeah. don't want it to go. <laughs> so. Just get back on DeviantArt and you'll fit right in. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, what I want to talk about today, because what I know you from is storyboarding. So, thinking about how you got started with these interesting characters and telling stories with them, what first got you interested in art? Um, actually. I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Um, but then I found out animals can die, and that's when I was like, um, maybe not. <laughs> so that's kind of like, no. <laughs> um, I really didn't have, like, um, like, a huge inkling, like, I have to do art as a person growing up. It kind of just happened. Like, art was kind of like my release when I would get frustrated or just, like, it was just always there for me. I never felt like upset when I did art compared to like other subjects I was like oh I hate this <laughs> so like that's kind of how it got into and even storyboarding I didn't know I was going to do storyboarding I've always been like for a lack of a better word like an animated person I'm always like using like even now like there's no video and I'm like using my hands to describe things um so but I would never be like an actor because like stage fright <laughs> yeah but um but yeah so I actually thought I was going to do like 3D modeling at first because that was the very first class I took when I went to the junior college because I didn't know where it was going. I was like, I just want to do art. Let's see where I go from here. Right. And then not until my last year at the junior college is when I was like, oh, maybe store because I took my first like kind of storyboarding class. The storyboarding professor kind of ditched us because he had to work on a film. Oh, no. Yeah, so we had another professor come in, but it was more about, like, analyzing shots than really storyboarding. Oh. So, But that was still really fun, and I think that's where I decided, like, this is what I want to do right. and what I really like because I love the sketchy quality of it. Like, I feel like when you go into, like, the final stages is when you kind of lose some of the life in it. 
Yeah, and so like the sketchy quality of storyboarding is like you have all that life still in mm. whatever you're doing. And then like telling stories and just, I like making people feel things. Even if like not everybody feels it, if one person feels it, I'm like, I did my job. Right, that's great. Mm. So for those listening at home, could you describe what storyboarding is and what its purposes are? Um, so storyboarding is basically sequential images that animators use to plan out all the shots of a movie or TV show or game. And sometimes um, if you're using it for TV animation, they will use them as keys and am animate straight from it. And it also plans out um, how the shot is gonna like be set up and how it's gonna move like panning wise and shot wise. Yeah. So when you know that an animator is gonna possibly take what you've done as keys, does it kind of add a lot of extra weight when you are storyboarding out a scene, knowing that this could end up almost as part of the final animation? Not really, because I always think of it as a key. It's like. Um, no matter what you do in storyboarding, you have to use that very specific scene to tell a story, and that's what keys are. They're all about telling stories. So I never really think of it as something scary. There might be a little like pressure to make sure I get that key correctly, but other than that, it's like, oh, this is basically what I still do. Right, so almost the opposite is feel empowering that, that you have such a hand in the storytelling process. Mm -hmm. That's what drove me to storyboarding, is because I like doing the keys of animation, but I hate in betweening the animation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to take it back before even that class, what kind of pushed you in maybe that animation direction? Like, oh, this is something I want to do. Was it community college? Was it something before that? Shows you were watching? Uh, well, all right, I'm going to have to admit, in high school, I was into anime. And yeah. <laughs> that's kind of how it all starts, right? Everybody yep. has that horrible anime phase. <laughs> But you know, the worst part is I was really bad at drawing anime characters. <laughs> like, I was like, me and my friend were like, yeah, we're gonna make like a manga together or something. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of like how I started enjoying art. So when I got to community college, that's where I was more of like, okay, I need to find myself more serious, but like, what? What am I doing? Like, that storyboarding class kind of did take me more into that direction of like, this is what I want to do. So the Kind of go back around, you were talking about your class at community college where you started doing some storyboarding. Do you remember some of the things that really helped you as you were becoming a storyboard artist? Uh, well, that book, Framed Perspective, helped a lot. Which book is that? Uh, Framed Perspective. I don't remember the author. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it'll, it'll come up instantly if you search it up. It's like a really well-known book. Um, but that one helped me out, and I studied a lot of films too. And like um, a lot of people just study films, but I was also studying things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So like I would start studying scenes from maybe Steven Universe because I liked it a lot. Or things that like really drew me into like the animation, I was studying those things too on top of it because I'm like, well, if this is what I want to do, I have to understand how does it work. And um, also video game like cutscenes, I've been studying those lately because um, I'm working with somebody on that. Like there's no class on how to storyboard for video game cutscenes, mm -hmm. so it's like, I have to look at what's already been done before I go and create something I'm not right. sure of. So when you're analyzing those, what kinds of things are you looking for? Um, I'm mainly looking at how like the shot is set up, how like the characters are interacting, and like how to make it not boring for people. Like how to make it visually pleasing, but still not go crazy with it either. Right. Do you feel like there's kind of a satisfaction in that challenge of it? Where so for me, I do photography and. I went to photography from video, and it was interesting how there was a challenge where you have a limited space to make something look good, but also get the point across. Do you feel like that limitation adds to your creativity and push you to make more creative stuff, or do you feel like it's a hindrance and that you'd like to do more and bigger? And... I think it always adds to it. Challenges are always good because um, it makes you think harder, and it's like, how can I get more creative with this? Like, how can I push the envelope with this? and still keep it appealing. That's great. So now that you've gone through community college, that class really brought you into animation, and you've been able to do some, like the 24 hour here at Cal State Fullerton. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you feel like, you, for storyboarders who 
might be less experienced than you, like either mistakes they might make or things that you've learned that have really helped you? Um, composition is key, definitely. Um, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. And oh, uh, perspective. Uh, as an animation student, perspective isn't required because mm -hmm. it focuses more on like the 3D aspect, I think, at our school. So take a perspective class even if you don't have to, it helps. I took a lot of classes that weren't required of me, but I still did them because I know my art wasn't where it was at, um, at that stage in life. So like going beyond classes is very important. I like spent a lot of my time thinking, oh, school's gonna teach me this stuff. And like half the time school didn't teach me these things. So I was like, okay, well, I need to find a way outside of school to like continue my education. So I went out and did that. I went to um, Concept Design Academy and I took a class there and that really helped. Uh, dynamic sketching with Patrick Ballesteros. It was really awesome. And um, I'm taking classes on schoolism online too right now. Yeah, about and, you and all that. Yeah. yeah, he's really great. And um, just, I like have this huge list of favorites from like things to help me like control pain and like Fluby Newbie is like a great site if you want to do storyboarding. Like it has so much good information on that website. That's great. Can you send those to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to know about those. <laughs> yeah. You told us earlier that you had work and that you're doing all these extracurricular activities as well as going to school. And I know for me, one of the hardest things when I went to college is time management and mm -hmm. figuring out how to do that. Do you have any advice to people who are maybe just starting off of how they can make the best use of the time that they have? Um, time management for sure. I'm super into planners. I'm part of like a whole planner community like that do stickers and design it and stuff. But that really keeps you on top of yourself. Plus like, I found it to be like a good release to like be creative, but not expected to be. You know, I would be like color coding things and like, that's kind of makes me more on schedule. Right. Um, definitely my job too, working at the Center for Demographic Research. They're very organized people there. And they're the, right down the street. Yeah, and um, they make me feel more organized because of that. So it makes me want to be more organized. That's also, right. getting a job on campus if you go to school is helpful. <laughs> I work at a grocery store and I think I was less organized there because like I couldn't go from school to work all the time. The if you work on campus, they kind of let you have a more relaxed schedule. They let me do homework sometimes. So that helped me so much more because I feel like I would have been I'm able to do a lot more things because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've been able to learn all this great stuff. You just gave us, and future storyboard artists out there, a lot of great information to be able to grow from. So because of that, I want to talk about the amazing projects that you've been able to do. So we talked about the 24-hour animation challenge, which is great. But I was just on, just looking at your Instagram alone, you've got character designs on there, you've got plain April. I want to hear a little bit about that. And, various, and also Inktober you're doing right now, which is great. We'll talk about that in a second, too. And then also, your other job at a video game company. So, let's talk about those. So, could you explain to me what Plain April is? Okay. Well, Plain April is um, basically, if you're like into plain air painting, um, you do one plain air painting um, a day for the month of April. I can never finish it because like I get so busy, mm -hmm. but I always try to do at least a couple. I'm actually doing the class on schoolism it's, um, with Nathan Fox, I think that's it. Oh, yeah. And it's He's, like... Oh, so good. Um, so he's teaching how to like do sketching, um, but paint, painting. So I, I've learned a lot because I think that's where I struggled with was color and how do I make this green not like tube green or something like yeah. that. So it's been a lot of fun. And one of my friends, he's really into plein air and so he's inspired me a lot to like push my work and actually try to do it more because he's like, oh, let's go paint or let's go draw or something. So that's been helpful. So actually, let's let's keep going on that. I didn't want to get off it too quickly, but you're talking about schoolism and CDA. Uh -huh. Can you explain those a little bit more to people? And then, um, yeah, things you've gleaned from them and what projects you've done? Uh, the first one I did was um, CDA, or Concept Design Academy. Uh, it's in Pasadena, and um, I think 
they have like the students can sign up first and then they have open enrollment for anybody else who wants to sign up for it. I did the 10 week summer course of dynamic sketching with Patrick Alceros and uh, it was a really great class. I liked it because it was all about the fundamentals of drawing but in a different way. It's like you learn basic drawing and then you kind of jump into like drawing characters and there's no in between and you're like, wait, I missed something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what class did I not take? So that's where I got to like get that little in between of how to see objects and draw them and like I had never drawn mechanical objects before and so he taught us how to like analyze them and really break them down and not be afraid to draw them and draw them and draw them. So now I'm drawing like tanks and trains, like especially trains are so complex, but like oh, yeah. once you learn how to break it down, it's like, oh, okay, now I'm not so scared of drawing a train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for those who've maybe never drawn before, when you're talking about breaking it down, what does that mean? Well, like breaking it into like the basic shapes. When you take that class, you're gonna go to squares and circles and triangles and like take those forms and turn them into three-dimensional objects and so it just builds off of that and all objects are basically squares, triangles and yeah. cubes and stuff so that's, that's awesome. what it is. Mm -hmm. So that's the CDA and then Schoolism is online, right? Yes, yeah, Schoolism is online and you can either do subscription or pay it the whole year. They have tons of classes you can learn from. There's the regular classes where you actually get critiqued by the professors but that's like $900. So you can change the class whenever you want during your subscription too. You don't have to just take the class. So you can jump around. There's like storyboarding classes, basic drawing classes, figure drawing classes, um, character design with Steven Silver. And uh, also I think there's a character design with Walter Tulip. But yeah, so those are great places to go if like you're feeling like you need an extra push. But you have to really be on top of yourself to do those because they're like subscription classes. They're not time. They're not like nobody's telling you to do your homework. So you have to do it yourself. And I think that's what separates people who really want to do it is like that drive. I'm doing this on my own. I'm going to do it. I'm going to dedicate that time. And that's kind of where my planning comes in is like I'll literally make a, a schedule during the summer of like a boot camp for myself and be like, okay, Mondays is... I'm going to sketch plein air or something, and then Tuesdays is I'm going to focus on perspective, so stuff like that. Right. Well, that's great that you're purposefully being active to push yourself in those fields. Yeah. And do you feel like by taking ownership of your art that it almost drives you to want to do more art? Like when it's not just, why well, I have to do this for class, but you're kind of taking control of your schedule and your time. Definitely, um, because I get to do pick my projects and what I want to work on. But it's also um, hard because you have to pick topics that you don't also enjoy either. Like perspective isn't the most fun thing you can do, but you have to go out and do it. So being able to kind of work on it on your own time and your own speed instead of being like, I only have two weeks to do this perspective drawing and I have three other classes on top of that. It's nice to be able to concentrate and give that thing your full attention. That's great. You were working at your friend's video game company while going to school, while having your other job. So, one, that's crazy. Two, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about the work you've been able to do with your friend on that video game project? Oh yeah, um, so his company is called Pacific Coast Gaming. And it's been kind of slow, so it's not like a super like, oh we have to get this stuff done, um, production's been really slow. So it's me and another artist, and she's doing character design, so I've been kind of waiting more on her character designs before I start storyboarding, because it's kind of like really difficult to do it without it, because then you're kind of just guessing everything. Yeah. We want to have a demo ready by January, I want to say. That's it's going to come up fast. Yeah, no, I'm not prepared for it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but, um, but it's also nice because he's not like... He doesn't have any hard deadlines right now. Um, I kind of give my own, myself hard deadlines just to stay on top of it. So you're doing storyboarding over there, that's your like position? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. that's great. And I actually just recently got approached by my friend in the film department to storyboard for their film project for their class. Oh, so that, <laughs> another wow. project on top of that. <laughs> and you're not getting any credit for it, so. Uh, no, I just like storyboarding, so I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, just like, I just like doing it for practice and stuff, so I'm just like, oh, cool, something new, sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, so now let's talk about the storyboard projects that you've done or ones you want to do. Like, So what have you done? Um, right now I'm in special studies um, with Laura Hoffman. You can do whatever you want. Like, people are even doing like 3D models for an illustration class. Oh, nice. That's pretty funny. But um, so I'm doing storyboard. I'm doing like an adaption of Little Red Riding Hood. Um, but instead it's um, a goat and a chupacabra. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, I'm working on the storyboards for that right now. But I think the most difficult part, being a student going into storyboarding, is they don't really teach you a lot about what like, making stories and character design. So you kind of have to learn that on your own. And like that's like the difficult part because I'm like, I just want a storyboard. I want to make these stories, but I have to do the whole process before you can get into the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, just like that planning you were talking about earlier. It's just the same way. Doing all that work that you have been doing really pays off. Yeah, yeah. It's great. So I'm doing that, and then like I said, that um, film project, and then... Uh, homework and doing schoolwork, so I haven't had too many plans for any storyboarding aside from the special studies classes. Can you talk about the projects you're working on for school right now? Yeah, so I'm doing um, life drawing with Joe. Oh, he's great. Yeah. And like as a storyboard artist, you can never do enough life drawing classes. It's so good for you. And it's really helped me a lot because he's so good. And then I'm doing drawing the heads and hands because... Oh, who's teaching that? Uh, Vladimir. I think it's helped me a lot with drawing heads because I've always, like, I draw so cartoony half the time that, like, if I want to do, like, film storyboards, I have to know how to draw regular people, so, <laughs> yeah. And you're saying film versus TV storyboards, right? Yeah, they're completely different. Like, yeah, could you talk about that? Yes, I can. <laughs> So, if you're going to do TV storyboards, you're basically planning out the animation and you're basically planning out the whole show through your storyboards. Some studios are like super heavily like, we're going to use these storyboards and send them off to get animated basically. The keys you were talking about earlier. Yeah. yeah. And then some studios are like, no, we're okay, like, you don't have to be on model, it's cool, whatever. So it's like 100% different if you're doing feature animation because... I think they have a team, from what I've heard, a team of just, like, character acting, and it's like, you're making the story, but nothing has to be on model, there's no, like, backgrounds or anything, you're just doing the story. And then if you're doing film, like, for live action, it's even more different, because you're just doing, like, um, composition and cinematography, and you're getting, like, the lighting and, like, the setup of everything, and you're not focusing on the acting, because that's the actor's job. Yeah, almost like beat boards for live action storyboards. Yeah, and I have no idea what it's like to storyboard for video games, so I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm learning this as I go along because there's not a ton of information about it, so it's just kind of a learning process for me. And that's an interesting note. Would you encourage people who maybe feel like they're unqualified for something to just go for it anyway and just try it and learn as they go, or do you feel like people should wait until they're have like a certain level of knowledge, if you will, to go into something like video game storyboarding? I think you have to have some knowledge, at least basic knowledge of what you're doing. Like if you were like say, like what I'm doing, like I want to do storyboarding, like you have to know how to storyboard in general. You have to know the basics of like what's composition and what's going to catch the viewer's eyes and like don't forget about the 180 rule and stuff like yeah. that. And then, but for something so specialized like video games, like just go for it and see what happens. Like, like I know a lot of people who just like, I never did this before, but I'm gonna try it and let's see how this works out. Yeah. So just having that confidence in yourself, like if you know you're a solid drawer and like you have um, a solid concept of design, you can do almost anything because you can learn the structure of it as you go. Well, and speaking of that, I was looking on your Instagram, and you've been doing Inktober every day, and a lot of them have been comics, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. So, thinking about storyboarding, how it compares to comics, how are they similar, and how are they different? The only real similarity with comics and storyboarding is that they're kind of sequential, and um, you have to tell a story in a limited amount of panels, but they are pretty much completely different. Because you're doing like a narrative story within like four panels compared to you have this like sequence of panels to tell a story. Um, and you only have like your little box of panels and comics to tell your story while well, you have so much more room and camera shots to do when you're doing storyboarding. Mm -hmm. 
okay, it's, it's, it's geek out time now. <laughs> what media do you like to use, both for Inktober and then for a general storyboarding? Inktober, I like to use ink and like pens and stuff like that. Like quill pens? Or, like... or no, just like microns and stuff like okay, that. Yeah. I would love to use a quill, but I don't have time. Like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one, ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I usually use. I know I can be like that annoying person It's like, no, you can't use Photoshop for Inktober. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm that person who's like, no, it has to be ink. <laughs> right. So microns, like an 005, 01? Um, it's because I do mine really small. They're like this, well, can't really see it. But <laughs> <they're pretty small. laughs> like, like three inches. So I go with like the 005 to 2. Got so it. that's what I usually yeah. stick with. That's great. Do you think it's more beneficial to your art if you're doing things hands-on, like with physical medium versus like Photoshop and things like that? Mm, I think it's really important to know both because the industry is so heavily like you have to know how to use Photoshop. And I know there's a bit of a learning curve when you first start using Photoshop. So using it daily is really important just to get a feel. But the traditional helps you transition better because if you know how to draw really well traditionally, You'll get past the Photoshop stuff, but if you're already not a solid drawer, you're not going to get past it in Photoshop. Photoshop right. is not a tool to like make you better, it's just another drawing tool. Right, that's a good idea. So, for Inktober, do you think that's why you want to do it physically and why you want to stick to kind of the traditional way because it's helping you kind of practice the fundamentals rather than using technology as a crutch? Mm, yeah, I, I would say it's not necessarily a crutch, but um, Inktober started off as like an inking thing and like getting artists out there to use inks because before then I was heavily like pencil only so Inktober got me to like get out of that and be like okay use a pen and stuff like that so I think it's also the traditionalism of it like that's how it all started and I want to keep that tradition going yeah. so I think that's also why I do it yeah represent yeah <laughs> <laughs> I respect that yeah no, that's great well, I think this is a good transition now into, um, you were talking about the film project with your film friend, various special studies you're doing with Laura and all of that. So what are the kinds of projects that you want to do in the future and what are you excited to learn? I want to go back to drawing like, like the more mechanical stuff again and start practicing that more. I got like a little taste of it and now I'm like, oh, I want to draw more of it. I don't really have time. Um, after the 24-hour animation, it was just so successful this year that I actually want to get more into animation again. I did my final film for production last spring, and it really was a bit of a downer how it ended, so it really crushed my spirits with animation. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I kind of took a break from it, um, and i just focusing on storyboarding, but now I'm kind of like, okay, I can do it again. Like I, I have like a little spark for it again. Yeah, that's great. I think that's super cool that that's what the 24-hour did for you. And then also, too, that's super cool of you to have taken the time to plan it right so that it re-inspired you to want to keep doing it. So I think that's super cool. I definitely agree with that because that was my pitfall when I took pre-production the first time. I took on way too much stuff. I was taking some film classes, which I kind of regretted because the film classes are so hard. And um, the film 300 class like kicked my butt. But I love the professor, he was hilarious. And it taught me a ton about composition. So if you're into storyboarding, definitely like take a film class, even if you almost fail it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that hindered me because my story wasn't really well done because I was rushing everything constantly. I was basically doing it just to fulfill the assignment. And that hurt me when the next semester came because when it came to animate it, I wasn't really into my story. So I barely finished it on time and it was just not planned out very well. Yeah. Well, that's great that you learned those lessons so that now you're having these really successful projects like what you just did this weekend. Yeah, always learn from your failure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and be inspired by your successes because that's, that's what you've done. That's great. Christian, did you have anything else? One last question. If you could sum up the most important thing for someone who wants to go into storyboarding, what would you say is like the one most important thing that they should become a master in, basically, in order to be successful? That's like so hard because there's so many things. But 
just being able to be a really good draftsman when you're drawing is so important because you need that clarity. And if you can't put out that clarity, it's not going to read well for your audience. And, you know, the whole point is to tell a story, and that's what we're doing. So tell your story is pretty much it. That's great. Well, cool, Liz. Well, speaking of that, your story, as we're seeing you grow in your artistic abilities, where can people find your art? And then eventually, when it finally comes out, the 24-hour film that you just finished. So it's eliza.bethcass, so Elizabeth Castillo, for my Instagram. And then um, for the 24-hour, if you want to see our film, our team name was Shameless Sellouts. So if you can find that YouTube, that's what we were. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's super awesome. Well, thank you so much for sitting down to a meal with us and uh, letting us know a little bit about your life. It was wonderful to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> thank yeah. you for having me. Oh, well, thanks so much for coming. Oh, what a time in the middle of a street. <laughs> Is that our one joke for this entire podcast? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was super interesting. Oh, yeah. Honestly, I, the thing that really stood out to me if you couldn't tell by all the questions I was asking about it, was just her belief in pre-production. I think it's something that I hold as important because it's such a new concept to me. But pre-production makes everything easier. Yeah, I think just based on Liz's example, pre-production really proves to be helpful even just in creating art. And I'll explain it this way by what Liz said in the podcast. When she had done her film in pre-production without doing all the planning, animation became kind of frustrating to her, and she wasn't happy with the film in the end. For the 24-hour animation, at the time when we recorded this podcast, I had just finished, she had put in all the time of pre-production that she needed in order to make that film a success, and it re-inspired her to get back into animation. And I think... I'm glad you asked those questions because that's the power of pre-production. You can not only learn from your mistakes, but you can be inspired by your successes. Nothing makes me want to do art more than getting the reaction from the audience that I was hoping for. Or at least one that's positive. Because when it's always criticism, it's good and you need to take it. But after taking that criticism time and time again, when you hit that success, it makes every one of those critiques totally worth it. Yeah, and from those critiques, you can plan better for next time. And I think Liz is a great example of that. So I hope all of you do check out her work on Instagram and as well as check out her 24-hour animation, which is on YouTube. She mentioned that in the podcast. And don't record your podcast in the middle of a stream. <laughs> <laughs>